It's an honor to be talking to you in this city that played such a pivotal role in my journalism career. I was just a few months into my marriage and just a few years into my career when my job with AP landed me here at this place, and I remember it very fondly. Here I wrote about the border, farm workers and migrants. I covered a UTEP basketball team coached by the great Don Haskins. I reported on the team's trip to the Sweet 16 in the NCAA tournament. That was not the, the last one, but the one before that. <laughs> in doing so, I upset a male-dominated sports reporting world by walking into the team's locker room for interviews after the game. I reported on a bowling alley massacre in Las Cruces, in which seven people were shot and killed, including two very young children. I got the first interview with the mother of those children. I covered a visit of a pope, a 100-year flood, the rescue of a spelunker from deep beneath Carlsbad Caverns. I kept watch on shuttle landings from White Sands, hustled out stories on the arrest of the Brewster Sheriff, who had cocaine stored in a horse trailer on the Marfa Fairgrounds. I covered the home front of a war, and so much more. But I had only scratched the surface when I left Austin after three and a half years. When I was here in El Paso, I was the only reporter, a, the only AP reporter, excuse me, for hundreds of miles covering West Texas, southern New Mexico, and occasionally parts of northern Mexico. It was like being a kid in a candy store. I wrote broadcast and newspaper stories. When I couldn't hire a streamer, I shot my own photos, and because AP also had a radio network, I fed audio with alligator clips through the unscrewed mouthpiece of a telephone handset. Probably a lot of you can't even picture that, but that's, that, some of us older folks know what that is. They call it that multimedia journalism now. Back then, I just called it being an AP guru. <laughs> so, but really, when I think of being a journalist in El Paso, I think of making things happen. I think of seeing your shortfalls and making sure they don't trip you up, of taking in all the talent around you, appreciating it, and learning from it. And as you know, as you can see from some of the people here, there's so much talent here. And there was so much talent in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez when I was here. But even more, El Paso reminds me to take advantage of every day that I have the opportunity and the privilege to be a journalist and to try to change the world. I don't consider myself to be a superior journalist or a supremely talented writer. The awards for my work are, that I have are few, in part because I sought few, but also because there are a lot of very talented people, more talented people out there than I am. But, I have always been up for the fight. Before coming to El Paso, I wasn't sure my journalism ambitions would ever come true. I thought that maybe I didn't really have what it took to be a reporter. Before El Paso, I worked in the AP Dallas Bureau, where the usual work was rewriting the copy of three daily newspapers at the Metroplex. Some days, I got to rewrite those rewrites for broadcast, and other days, I spent in front of a computer screen, and this was pre-internet, making sure that the newspapers got all the important uh, wire stories for the day. There were times when things got exciting, such as the covering two major airplane crashes at DFW Airport, or the day that I had the chance to spend time in a cage with a young gorilla while covering the visit of a female gorilla, an adult female gorilla, to the doctor because she couldn't get pregnant. But often, the work was about other people's reporting, and not my own. And then, the rains came, in Brownsville. The rain accumulated so quickly on the poorly designed, designed roof of the three-story Amigo store, Amigo store, and eventually, the structure gave way, trapping people who had gone there to seek shelter. Several were killed. But it just so happened on this day, I had gone into the Dallas Bureau wearing a pair of pants that one of the women in the AP Bureau had given me. I was used to hand-me-downs, and just like the clothes passed down to me by my sisters, the pants I wore that day didn't really fit. They were a bit loose. But because Bureau work was usually done sitting at a desk, I figured the little bit of, a, of looseness wouldn't be a problem. Journalism lesson number one, never assume. Since I was one of the few in the Bureau who spoke Spanish, and I was on Muret that day, I was dispatched to Brownsville, where part of my job was to dictate new leads each time another survivor, or sadly, 
a body was pulled from the, state, the store's wreckage. Now keep in mind, this was before cell phones. That meant we had to be first. And I had to do everything I could to get in new leads, which is all the more difficult when your loose-fitting pants have become looser <laughs> from the day's wear, are threatening to fall off, and you have to race at top speed to a bank of pay phones. So there I was, sprinting as fast as I could, as my short little legs would take me, with a ball of my pants wadded up in my hand and my waist. <laughs> the funny thing is, I was not praying that the pants stayed up. Instead, I was praying that I got my lead in before everyone else. Journalism lesson number two, the story comes first. As it turned out, I not only hung on to my pants literally, but in, sen in a sense figuratively. I had impressed my bosses enough with my field reporting. I knew you guys thought that I was going to have to have lost them, right? But no, I didn't lose them. <laughs> but I had, I had impressed my bosses uh, with my reporting, shown them that I was meant to be outside chasing news rather than inside rewriting it, and that a few months later I was promoted to the El Paso job. I like to think that I fought for that promotion, fought through my errors in judgment, my greenness at the craft, fought to arrive at a place where I could record the fights and the struggles of others. And that is what journalism gives us. Not what we see and hear on some TV news shows or daily talk shows. Instead, we are in a fight to fulfill our obligation to protect this democracy. We may not think about it as we drill down on a Donald Trump tweet or do a Snapchat from an election event, but by going out and gathering facts, making sense of them, and explaining why they are meaningful in people's lives, we play a vital role in this democracy. It's easy to get disillusioned as we watch our friends and colleagues get pushed out of the business. And this might happen to you, it may not be happening now, because of newsroom layoffs. It is hard to be cynical as we continue to see, it is, excuse me, it is not hard to be cynical as we continue to see news organizations maintain largely white staffs year after year, giving short shrift to diversity. You can become jaded when you hear that the public doesn't trust the press. I say, don't be disillusioned. I say, keep up the fight. Muster what your mama gave you. I know that's where my fighting instincts come from. They are the instincts that help me to take over the care of my younger brother and sister, while my mother worked two and at times three jobs to make sure all of us stayed on a path to, do, to have a better life than she had. <laughs> they are the instincts that I relied on when I arrived in the newsroom and realized I was far behind others in what I knew about being a journalist. They are the instincts that inspired me <clears throat> to spend my own money each year and use my vacation time to attend journalism conferences like this, NHJ, IRE, SPJ, Unity, to learn the skills I lacked and to develop professionally. There are journalism students here. You know, as much as I wanted to, I haven't won a Pulitzer Prize yet. <laughs> I haven't sent a high official to jail, a high level official to jail, and I haven't exposed the toxicity, uh, excuse me, the toxic poisoning of a community. But that's okay. I'm pleased to be in Washington, covering politics and the Latino community. But you don't have to be in Washington to be a solid journalist. I think we learned that from the panel that we heard on immigration and some of the people that we know here. It doesn't happen in every story, but as journalists get the chance now and again to live up to that obligation I spoke of earlier, uh, the, the obligation to protect democracy, we get that chance every now and again. We should always be looking for those, ch those chances and seizing them. I have tre treasured this privilege, and I still treasure this privilege of documenting a search for justice. I, it still makes my heart race to know I have the privilege to speak and ask questions of almost anyone and to listen to them and, and detail their deepest heartache, their outrage, their anger, and yes, their joy. I have even had the chance to do this on the campaign trail, to talk to the Latino, Latino electorate and what compels them to work on campaigns or stand in line to caucus. For some, it's a similar belief in their obligation to do our democracy. For others, it's the loss of a job or the desire for immigration reform. 
When I was in journalism school, the inspirational movie that wannabe journalists always cited was All the President's Men. Woodward and Bernstein. That movie is credited with taking journalism to a whole new level, inspiring investigative journalists. This generation's movie is Spotlight. I haven't seen the movie. Oh <laughs> I will. But I know the Boston Globe stories that it is based on and the series of stories. It gives me hope that a whole new generation will be inspired to join the fight, to investigate, to speak for those who cry for justice and whose cries for justice have gone unheard. In this age of social media, when branding and self-promotion have become a vital part of the job, it is easy to get heady about what we do, to think we are the experts, the enlightened, the stars, that it is about us. The best journalists I know think otherwise. In his story on the movie Spotlight, writer Christopher Orr of the Atlantic, uh, of the Atlantic uh, Magazine points out the Boston Globe reporters even after publishing their Pulitzer Prize winning stories, wondered how could they have missed the child abuse that was hiding in plain sight for so long? <coughs> that question makes me think of the Texas A&M bonfire collapse, which was the last big story I covered for the Austin American Statesman before going to Washington. The bonfire was a 90 year tradition that ended when it collapsed and killed 12 students and former students. That bonfire had been built in plain sight for years. Hazing and gender hostility were part of its tradition. Its design became increasingly hazardous, and yet it continued to be built, as statesman reporter Mike Ward and I discovered and documented. We wrote, we wrote about these problems after the collapse. I was first to get the interview with a campus professor, an engineer who described in detail how the bonfire design evolved and why it was flawed. The engineer's perspective had been sought by newspapers across, across the state and country, and I was the one who landed the interview. But where were we before then? Were there signs or complaints we ignored? Why had no one done an open records request on this activity before the collapse, before the deaths of 12 bright young people, people who, if they were alive today, or who would have been your peers, same age as you are now? I am proud to say that on the first day that Donald Trump announced his presidency, we at NBC News Latino did not bury his statements that Mexico was sending Mexicans who are rapists, criminals, and drug dealers into the US. That was our lead paragraph. And we ran it under the headline, Donald Trump announces presidential bid by trashing Mexico Mexicans. We did not shut our eyes to the bigotry of that statement. Some at the time questioned whether we were sensationalizing or playing into his theater. But in this case, my astute editor, Sandra Lili, did not want to have to ask the question later, where were we? How did we miss this? How to cover Trump without being part of his reality theater is a question for another panel. But now more than ever, as we plow through this absurd election, I am glad I still have the power to fight because I am a journalist. Thank you.